The Bureau of Balthazar had no idea that his life was about to change when he received an invitation to watch the Hope for Africa series sponsored by Hope Channel. Recently, Hope Channel sponsored this evangelistic event in Kenya. Hundreds of thousands of people experienced life transformation and were baptized through the powerful Word of God presented at about 10,000 locations throughout East Central Africa, broadcast on Hope Channel platforms and shared online. Miburo, the founder and leader of a Christian church in the nearby country of Burundi, was invited to watch the event at one of the downlink locations. In 2011, Miburo embarked on a spiritual quest for biblical truth. Frustrated by his search for a church that fully embraced his yearning for authentic spirituality, he established his own congregation. He watched the presentations for three days and was captivated by what he learned from the event's main speaker, Pastor Mark Finley. Miburo, eager to share this newfound information, invited his congregation to join him in watching the rest of the programming. Miburo made a life-altering decision, dedicating himself anew to Christ and choosing to be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. Half of his congregation joined him after a few days in this transformative journey. I am extremely happy to have received the message of salvation and even happier because my congregation willingly joined the Adventist church. My greatest desire is to see the people in this area come to Christ because time is very short and Jesus is coming soon. By the end of the series, the other half of the congregation also embraced the faith and were baptized. This story celebrates the profound influence that Hope Channel programming can have on countless hearts in Africa and around the world. Hope Channel's mission is to share the gospel through a global network. Currently, they broadcast more than 80 channels on television, as well as produce content for social media and digital platforms, including YouTube, in more than 100 languages. Hope Channel celebrated its 20th anniversary in 2023. They seek to extend their network to fulfill Jesus' command to take the gospel to all nations. Please pray for Hope Channel as they open new channels to reach unentered areas. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Mountain View. How is everyone feeling this morning? Sleeping still? Sounds <laughs> How's everyone this morning? Are, are we happy to be here worshiping God? Um, it has been a busy week, and I know there's lots, lots going on today as well, but I do want to take some time and just welcome each and every one of you here, um, those that are joining us online as well. So thankful that, that they can do that and that we have the ability, uh, technology is great, that even when we can't be here, and I've, I've taken advantage of that, I wasn't here last week, but I was here online because I wasn't able to be here in person. So I, I do appreciate that technology and we want to make sure that the people that are joining us online feel welcome as well. So welcome to Mountain View, we are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. There is some business, I don't think the slides are coming up, but there, is, uh, there are a number of announcements that um, I'm going to share with you. So the corral practice, um, that takes place every Friday evening at 6 p.m. And I know that they are looking for additional basses and sopranos. Um, I would love to be part of that. I can't make it Friday evenings though, so we have MGO. Um, but if you are interested in singing with the choir, um, it's a wonderful experience, and we would encourage you to take part in this. So every Friday evening at 6 here at the school, they practice, and they are preparing for a mini concert that's coming up during the May 4th service. So there are two more practices before that, so it's never too late to join. So beginner crater roll class, this is kind of a, a, a new class now. We've had this in the past and it's starting again. So every week 
Uh, that's going to be room 38. I'm not sure exactly which room 38 is. Okay, at the end of the hallway and to the right, I'm told. Um, I trust Mr. Barrett because he, he's very familiar with the school. <laughs> so that is for ages 0 to 3. And those classes have started, so you can talk to, talk to Melissa Barrett if you want to get more details. But we do want to support all of our kids at every age here at Mountain View. And, um, and that is, that's an important way to, to get them started early. Young adults, so this is, a, this is a new class as well. So the Collegiate Sabbath School class is now happening weekly as well. That's for ages 18 to 30, so a young adult class. Um, there's going to be hot drinks and snacks and a uh, monthly praise and worship session where they're going to be uh, taking part in our church service as well. So we'd encourage if you are a young adult or you know some young adults that could benefit from taking part in this type of a, a class, uh, they are meeting here Room 29, again, the numbers mean nothing to me. Uh, can anybody tell me where room 29 is? <laughs> 28? <laughs> Probably right beside 28, so I'm guessing down there somewhere, but I, I don't know for sure. So that is taking place every Sabbath morning, so make that way. Okay, so it's the other side. So, <laughs> so but yeah, the collegiate Sabbath school class, so for young adults, that is now happening here at Mountain View, so make sure that you... If you're a young adult or you know somebody that could benefit from that, um, encourage them to attend. World Adventure Day, this is coming up very soon, May 18th um, at 2.30. That's going to be taking place at Wentworth Manor, uh, southwest Calgary. So that's a, uh, a time to share their talents and make people smile. This is a, an outing where they're going to be blessing. Um, Wentworth Manor is is a retirement or a care facility, and that is, is going. So if you would like to participate or you have adventure age children, make sure you make a note of that in your calendar. Pathfinder Campery fundraising. So this is, this is big. I'm sure all of you are aware by this point that our Pathfinders have a major event this year. So the Pathfinders are going to Gillette, Wyoming in August, and they need your support. So they have been fundraising for their personal expenses. Um, there has been some challenges, and, and that's why this special fundraising campaign is taking place. So I don't know all the details, but from the few that I do know, I know that the buses and the travel and all of that has been a challenge. So they have been getting quotes for the buses for more than a year already now. And I know a lot of the quotes that they had, the bus companies came back and said, you know what, this is a major event. There's a lot of people requesting buses. The price has more than doubled. So they're canceling the contracts that existed and they're coming back with quotes that are more than double. So I believe they have uh, something lined up that is reasonable, but it is still far more expensive than initially planned. So some of these special requests for, for assistance are for unplanned expenses that are simply out of their control. So if you are able, uh, the Pathfinder Club would very much appreciate. This is a major event that happens only every five years, uh, and they are going to have an amazing experience as they take part in this event with over 60,000 other Pathfinders from around the world. Mountain View Visioning, that is taking place um, today as well as April 20th. So after potluck, after the service today, um, the visioning for Mountain View, um, how, how to get involved and all of these things uh, is going to continue this afternoon. And that is going to be taking place today under the direction of uh, Ken Weeb, who was the former Alberta Conference president. So he's come down and to join us, and I believe he's going to be here again next week to preach for us. So we're so glad to have him here, and he's going to be leading out in this visioning session this afternoon. So make sure that you're not going home right after church, and if you do, make sure that you come back and get back here by 2 p.m. so you can be part of this special visioning session as we set the, the direction for our church going forward. There is a first reading for membership transfer. 
This is for Donna Jackson, uh, and she is transferring from Salmon Arm SDA Church to Mountain View. I don't see her here this morning, but she has very close ties to our church through Lara and Joel. Uh, that's uh, Lara's mother. So we are so glad that she is coming and that she is transferring to join us here at Mountain View. And also for Tommy Sano. I don't know if I'm saying that perfectly, <laughs> but I know I see her here. Um, my pronunciation, I'm sure, is terrible, so please forgive me. <laughs> but she is transferring from the Toronto Japanese SDA Church. And again, somebody that has ties with our church through uh, Melissa. That's Melissa Barrett's mother. So we are very thankful. She has sung with us. She is a very talented musician, so we are glad that she is coming. And she has been here for a time, but her membership is being officially transferred. These are the first readings, so there will be second readings in the coming weeks. CWAA constituency meeting is coming up. That is Thursday, May 9th at 7 p.m. So designated delegates, if, if you know um, at this point, you would have been contacted if you have been selected as a delegate, and they will attend this meeting and represent Mountain View and the concerns or any, any comments that we have uh, at, at the CWA constituency meeting to, to share um, our thoughts as a church and how we, can, how we can help support the school. And I know that was very quick and there was lots of announcements, but if you missed anything or if you would like a refresher, you just want to see what's going on, there is a lot more going on than what we were able to talk about in this brief few minutes this morning, visit our website, mountainviewadventist.ca, check your bulletins, and you will get far more information than I'm able to share with you quickly in these few minutes. I'd invite our praise team to come forward, and we will have just a very quick word of prayer. Um, yeah, come on up, guys, and then we'll, we'll have a quick word of prayer. Please bow your heads with me. Father, as we meet here this morning to worship you, we just like to pray that each one seated here would be blessed by the music and the song and the, the words that, that we hear. Lord, we invite your presence here to be with us, and we pray that not only we would be blessed, but that you would be blessed by our presence here this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. As you can see, we have a new team this morning. Uh, last time when I was here, only Alex was with me. Now pretty much we double the, the numbers of the singers uh, and uh, instruments also. <laughs> As you can see, we have two pianos now. Uh, with us is Lisa on the second keyboard and uh, three M's. Mia, Matilda, and Madeline from Australia. So the first song we're gonna sing, we start the worship with I will sing of my Redeemer. But before we start, I wanna tell you something about this guy, the composer. Uh, probably you know the name. His name is Philip Bliss. He was a great gospel singer, evangelist, and songwriter in 19th century. So this song is pretty much already 150 years old. Uh, his gospel songs resonated in huge tents and evangelistic crusades. Many of his hymns are still sung around the world in many languages, even in Bulgarian in my. And let me confess you, this is one of my favorite hymns uh, from my childhood, actually. Uh, Bliss was not only uh, writing the, the lines, the text of the music, but also the, the melodies, the tunes of the songs. Uh, except this song, actually, for which he wrote only the, we know only the, the text, the lyrics. 
Are you wonder why? Here is the reason. When he was 38 years old, he and his wife boarded the train on a way to a huge gospel crusade. When the train was crossing over a bridge, the bridge collapsed. He survived, but his wife was trapped in a compartment engulfed by a fire. Attempting to save her, he lost his own life. Isn't that similar to what Jesus has done for us? Because he loved us so much, he sacrificed his, himself to save us. Lately, on a piece of paper found in his luggage were those lines, which you read there on the, on the picture. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me, to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Actually, no one had ever heard the original tune of that song. The tune we know today uh, was soon added by his good friend, James McGranahan. The arrangement we will play today is a little bit different from the original song. And uh, we didn't have chance to practice much enough. We have only two practices but hope we will make our best. So please help us with the sing when we sing together. Sealed my pardon, paid 
It's now time for our children's story. As the children come forward for their story, uh, I'd like to re remind you that they may have their hands out, and if you have any change or things that you would like to give them, money, um, that is going towards our church building fund. We have land down just below the school here, and we are in the process of a capital campaign to raise money for a church building. So that is what they are collecting for as they come forward, and I'll hand it over to Raquel for the story. Good morning, how are you? Beautiful day outside, right? Yes, I like how you're matching, all three of you. Okay, anybody else? No more coins? Yes? Okay, have you ever prayed for someone or for something and you've, you've seen God answering you? Yes? Yes. Is it your mom? Yeah, I remember. And your sister. Yeah, I remember when we prayed for your mom. So the story that I have today is a, is a true story. It's about uh, a person who lived in Thailand. So, okay. Uh, this, is, this story is about um, a gentleman named Mr. Top. And you're gonna understand why his name was Mr. Top. Okay? So Mr. Top, this is not the best, but somehow, okay? Mr. Top owned a shop. Well, actually he didn't have a shop, but he sold shirts. Okay? So that's why they named him Mr. Top. Like Top from the top, okay? So Mr. Top lived in Thailand, and every day he took his shirts, his tops, he took them to the market, and then he sold them. But his business started going down. He didn't sell as much as he needed to come with enough money to provide for his family. So how do you think that made him feel? Jenny, what do you think? If Mr. Top wasn't selling, any shirts and wasn't bringing enough money to his house. He felt sad not, not getting enough money. Yeah, he was probably feeling very sad. Yes. He was feeling down. Yes. Okay, sad, down. He felt poor. He probably also felt that he didn't have enough money, right? Maybe anxious why people don't, why do people not take it, like the shirts? Yeah, he was probably feeling all that. So while he was, while that was happening with Mr. Top, the Adventist church was building uh, a place, okay, to do mission work. And then a new pastor arrived. His name he was, or is, he's probably still around. Uh, Pastor Sudakar, okay? He was a Bible teacher, and he was teaching English as well as offering Bible study. So as he was going in the neighborhood, he knocked uh, on Mr. Mr. Top's house, right? And then he's like, okay. And then he, Mr. Top opened the door, and uh, Pastor Sudakar shared what he was doing. Say, okay, I'm a Bible worker and I am teaching English. Um, I would like to know what, you know, if you want me to pray for you. Mr. Top, remember where he lives? 
Do you remember? No. Okay, so he lives in Thailand, in Bangkok. And the predominant uh, religion there is Buddhist. Buddhism, sorry. Buddhism. So nothing to do with Christianity. So when Mr. Top was asked if Pastor Sudakar could pray for him, what do you think he answered? Yes? No? Maybe he is Buddhism. Yeah, being a Buddhist, he, ha he was nothing. He wanted nothing to do with Christianity. Not only he said, no, thank you. Well, maybe he didn't say no, thank you. He just said no. But he asked Pastor Sudaka to leave his house. So Pastor Sudaka could have been angry with his reaction. But instead, he went home and he prayed for him. And that night, Mr. Top had a dream. And the dream was about this visitor who came to his house, this pastor, this new Bible worker. So next morning, he looked for him. And he shared his dream with him. Let me see that. I don't miss any details, okay? Um, so he dreamed with Pastor Sudakar and the little church that's and the little church was surrounded by light. So the pastor and the church was surrounded by, that, by light. And him, Mr. Top, was surrounded by darkness. So he looked for a pastor and he said, you know what? I want the light that I saw in my dream. Could you pray for me? Oh, the first time he didn't want him to pray for him. He even asked him to leave his house. But this time he wanted what Pastor Sudaka was offering. So Pastor Sudaka prayed for him. And then guess what happened? As every day he went out, took his shirt, right? And he started not selling only one, but two, three. And all the shirts, every day, all the shirts that he took out to the market to sell, he sold. So eventually... He joined the Adventist church. Let me say, okay. Through this experience, Mr. Top learned an important truth. God wants to bless us in unimaginable, unimaginable ways. He wants to provide for our every need and fills us, fill us with his love. But sometimes we get in the way because we do not trust in him listen to him or we or because we don't ask him to help us mr top did not even know jesus but he recognized how god answered the prayer of pastor sudakar so as, uh, eventually mr top knew jesus and he now is part of the adventist church you too can pray for someone who doesn't know jesus just like Pastor Sudakar prayed for Mr. Top. When you do, watch God, how God change, changes their life through the power of his love. So maybe sometimes when somebody does something to you that is not really nice, instead of, you know, trying to get back to them, let's pray for them and see how God works in their lives and in our lives. Would somebody like to pray? Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be more like you. Help us not to get into temptation. Help us for every day for us to get better and our stuff, for our schools to get better and our church to get built. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now time where we return our tithes and offerings to, to God. Uh, he has blessed us so greatly, and this is our opportunity to, to give back. Uh, the loose offerings today will be going towards Hope Channel. And just as a reminder, you can also give online uh, through our website, Mountain View Adventist, and Adventist Giving. So as the deacons come and collect your offering, um, 
we'll just, I'll just ask them to come forward and we'll have a, a very quick word of blessing. So please just bow your heads with me quickly as we have a quick word of blessing on the offering. Father in heaven, Lord, you have blessed us so greatly. We owe every breath to you. And Lord, as we return what little we have, we just like to pray that you would use it to change not only our hearts, but the world around us. In, and may it be used as you intend, Lord, to reach people for your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we seek the Lord in prayer, um, I know there may be some special requests or petitions that you may have in your heart. Uh, we're going to have a garden of prayer here this morning, so I'm going to kneel down over here. There's a nice comfy carpet. Um, if you have any special requests or thanksgiving that you would have silently, um, feel free to join me up front and as, as we seek the Lord in prayer. Please bow, bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for who you are and what you have done for each and every one of us. Lord, you created us and we're told that you numbered the very head, hairs of our head and you know intimately what we are going through in our lives. Lord, you know the pain, you know the suffering that, that comes through this, this life and in this world that filled with sin. Lord, we just like to thank you for coming down and putting yourself into our mess that we may have hope. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the salvation that you have offered us and the grace. Lord, none of us are perfect. We all have fallen short and we, we fail you. Lord, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for your blessing. Lord, you know the struggles that we face and we know that there are people that have come forward, they have special requests. 
Lord, there may be, we know that there's people in our congregation that are struggling with sickness. They may be struggling with situations in their families. They may be struggling with relationships or finances or maybe employment. Lord, you know our needs and you know what is best for us and we pray that you would take these requests and not give us what we want, Lord, but give us what is best for us. Lord, you've also given us the remedy for many of the struggles and trials that we face. You've told us that we should not be anxious for anything because we have you and we have a relationship with you. You created this whole world out of nothing and there is nothing too big for you to overcome. Lord, we just like to thank you for that and we, we give you thanks for everything that you have done for us. We thank you that we are here today worshiping you. We thank you for the health that we do have. We thank you for the food, the air, the water, the clothes we have to wear. Lord, there's so much, there's so many ways that you have blessed us. Help us to focus on that and recognize your love for us. We know that our life here on this earth is temporary and that we are looking forward to being in your presence for eternity. And Lord, we are so thankful. Lord, be with our speaker here this morning. Be with Pastor Julio as he brings us the message. And may each heart be touched and be brought closer to you as a result. Lord, open our hearts to the message that you have for us. Help us to open our minds that we may not be set in our ways, but that we may be brought closer to you we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. words 
Yeah, and you know they had the extra, <clears throat> the extra piano and, and the singer. They're just amazing. I really enjoyed it today. I just need to put my phone over here. Before I begin, I just want to invite Elder Weeb before, because um, he's going to be doing our visioning session this afternoon, this week and next week. Uh, we're going to be forging a path forward. I don't know if you noticed. There's been intentionality in everything we've been doing. Uh, Elder Corkum, he'll be here after. He's just preaching at the Ukrainian church today. Uh, the, he did a series on service, and now we're going to focus on vision. So there's an intentionality to everything we're doing. I just want to pray with you uh, for, for what you're doing today. I want to do it right now. We'll pray again, of course, after, but uh, come up here, Elder Weeb. Uh, he came all, all the way from Lacombe today, uh, it, and so we're very grateful that you're here today. Thank you for coming. Let me pray for you, okay? Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing Elder Weeb here uh, to spend some quality time with us and to help us, Lord, draft a, a, a course, Lord, that we can follow. Um, Lord, we ask for safe travels as he traveled here and, of course, as he travels back home, Lord. Be with him, with his wife and his children and grandchildren, Lord. So I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so... God is looking for dreamers, part one. Just wanted to uh, get into it today. <clears throat> you know, I forgot to pray for the blessing, but I know you prayed. Thank you, Chris. Nice to see you today, brother. <clears throat> Let me just have a quick prayer here. Lord, I'd like to invite your presence as we get into Scripture today. Be with us, Lord, and may the words that I speak here today, may they be your words, not mine. I pray this in Jesus' name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> God is looking for dreamers part one, the missing ingredient. I want to introduce to you this particular lady. Anybody ever heard of Florence Chadwick? Huh? Or maybe you have come across her. Well, Florence Chadwick was a famous swimmer. Do we have any swimmers? Anybody know how to swim here in this uh, sanctuary? Huh? Put your hand up if you know how to swim. Or thereof, right? Okay. How many of you know how to tread water? Huh? Can you tread water? Yeah. It's great exercise, by the low impact, but great workout. If anytime you go swimming, you get really hungry after coming out of the water. Now, she was a professional swimmer. Let me make sure we have her up here. Yep. Professional swimmer. She swam across the English Channel twice, right? I don't know if you've ever visited there. I've never been there, but from what I hear, the word, the Waves there in the Atlantic Ocean are, are fierce, and she did it twice. But there was one place where she wanted to swim across, and this was actually uh, the Catalina Island just off the coast of California. Now, the story goes that if you've ever visited the area, there is a lot of sharks in the war water there. It's infested with sharks. Now, who here would like to get in a pool with sharks, huh? Now listen, I'm scared to go. <laughs> I'm scared to go into the wilderness where there's bears, let alone sharks. But here, she decided to do this across from, uh, you know, the Huntington Beach there, all the way to Cat Catalina Island. Now look at that. That's 22 miles. How many kilometers is that? That's like uh, 30 some kilometers, right? That's a long distance. And she swam it there, 
and back. Not just one way. She had to swim there and back. Now, to be fair, she, she had boats. She had her family there. She had some people who were professionals following her along. And whenever a shark was spotted, they had a shotgun and they would shoot the shotgun and sh fire it off to scare off the shark. I don't know, friends. I don't know. That, to me, it's like, I don't know if I would want to do that. Now, people who've done uh, other feats, they've devised a cage that drags along just to keep the swimmer. I think that would be probably the safest way to go, is go swim in the cage that drags along just from the safety. But I don't know if I want to be free watering a shark. Uh, I don't know. Sharks are pretty fast. But she decided to do it. <clears throat> Now, on the day that she decided to do it, it was super cold, very cold, and it actually was very foggy. And as she got into the water, she started to swim, take the few strides. She was okay. And she did it. And, and you know, sharks were kept, kept swimming by. The, the, the men kept looking out for her, making sure that she got across safe, and she was able to make it safely. Now, once she started heading back, it was a little bit more difficult because it got even colder and the fog got even more intense. And she kept swimming and swimming and swimming. Finally, at some point, she had to give up. She couldn't do it anymore. She, she, she just lost focus of where she was going. And she asked to be pulled out. She couldn't do it anymore. The cold got to her. The cold got into her bones. You ever taken a cold shower? Hmm? I like to take cold showers, just so you know. Very, it wakes you right up. But it's different if you're in the water for several hours. You start to feel it. At the 16-hour mark, she tapped on the boat that was next to her and said, pull me out. I can't do this anymore. They pulled her out. They put her in the boat. And she was devastated. I was reading uh, one of the stories in regards to that. They, they, they brought a warm blanket. They put boiling water in, in, in uh, containers, and they put it next to her, trying to get her spirit. She was devastated. She was sobbing. She was crying because she was not able to finish it. Now, he was interesting. As the boat was crossing from one spot to the other, here's what a news reporter said. It goes on to say, at a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Do you know how far she was? One mile from the shore. All she needed to do was swim another 20 minutes. Now, mind you, a mile is still a lot to swim. You know, I, I'm not a professional swimmer. So, but for her, a mile, 20 more minutes, she would have made it. But because she couldn't see the shore, she had to be pulled out. And she wasn't able to do it. Friends, I want to share a Bible in the story that magnifies this tremendously. So I want us to go to Scripture and I want us to go to the book of Numbers. And here's where God is speaking to the children of Israel just before they are to enter the promised land. God is giving the children of Israel a vision. He's charting the course and saying, here's where you need to go. In fact, the first two verses speak volumes. It says, uh, Joshua chapter, uh, sorry, Numbers chapter 13, verses 1. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. Here it says, the Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Let's stop right there. The land I am giving to the Israelites. We can camp on that spot for hours. The Lord had already promised the promised land to the children of Israel. He, it says it right. The land I am giving to the Israelites. There's no ifs or buts. God had told them, this is going to be yours. He had given them a vision of where they were going to go. And it says, send one of the leaders from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. I was reading through the names of the, uh, of the people that were sent. And each one of those individuals that was sent as a spy, their names had wonderful meanings. Some of them, their name meant God is strong. Joshua's name alone means God, Jesus saves, God saves. Imagine that. These are the people, these are the spies that are being sent to scout the promised land. 
Here, let me read this uh, from one of the books that I was reading. It says, leaders who trust God and believe in his ability to do the impossible will move their churches from where they are to where the Lord wants them to be. That's all of us here, friends. Not just me or the board. It's all of us here. We're all leaders here in this church. It says here, which leads me to my first takeaway today. My first takeaway today is God charts the course ahead of time. God revealed to the children of Israel where they were going to go ahead of time. He didn't wait to do it before. He said, listen, this is where I need you to go. I need you to cross the Jordan River and this land that you're going to set foot on is going to be yours. God told them ahead of time where they were going to go. Think about the theological implications of that, friends. In our own lives, when God tells us, I need you to go here, I need you to do this. And we start to question and, and, and doubt what God is telling us to do. Let's continue in the narrative. Here, it says in verse 13. I'm going to skip because uh, that line from verse 3 to uh, 16 is actually talking about the names of each of the uh, folks who are sent. But let me just focus here. It says, Moses gave men, the men, these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong, whether weak, whether few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good? Is the soil good? Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls? Or are they unprotected like open camps? Here Moses is giving them specific instructions as to what they are to do. This is a reconnaissance mission, right? This is a SEAL team heading out into a special operation, right? It says here, is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops, you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So Moses, there was an intentionality as to when he's sending them. It was harvest season. And Moses knew this. And he says, let's go see whether this land that God has given us. Because here's the thing. Did God really need to send, I mean, sorry, did Moses really need to send spies? No. God had told him that that land is full. It's prosperous. But he sent the spies as proof. Because they wanted to bring proof back to the people that this land was good. It goes on to say, Here's the spies. They traveled. They had their camera equipment, right? Their, their camouflage clothes, right? Their inflatable tents, you know, very quiet. They don't want to make any absolutely no, absolute noise. They had a, a satellite system so they can touch base with base camp and send signals where they are. They had a GPS tracker. Here's where we are. We're going up the hill, up the Negev, right? When they came to the valley of Eshkol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. I think we've all seen pictures of this growing up, right? Two men with a big thing of grapes in their backs, right? They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. You know, we don't get figs out here. Anybody here ever tried figs? They are so good, right? They are so good and so healthy for you too. Pomegranates. They say gladiators used to eat uh, pomegranates to give them strength. It says, the place was called the Valley of Eshkol, which means cluster. Because of the cluster of grapes, the, Israelites, the Israelite men cut there. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned. Now, who here eats, you guys ever tried a pomelo? There's, you know, I, eat one, I cut one pomelo and it feeds my whole family. I like to think that each one of the clusters of grape was the size of a pomelo. Now, this is my own imagination interpretation. You know, I know that if I visit some of your countries, who here likes mangoes, huh? Now, I know it's almost lunchtime, so please, bear with me. I'm just, yeah, we shouldn't be putting images like that in our heads, right? But the grapes... The images of mangoes and all the, the fruits, right? Just so juicy. 
I like to think that a pomelo is the same size of these uh, clusters of grapes. You would just have to take one, right, as opposed to sever a cluster. You eat one and you be full. The point that the Bible is making here is that there was abundance to where God is leading them. God already knew the place. God knows the earth. The Bible says the whole earth is mine and everything in it. Of course, God would know where he's leading the children of Israel to this place where they were, the fields were green. Uh, and they were, you know, that it, uh, the abundance was there, prevalent. This is what the Bible is pointing towards. So it says here, let me just read, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness at Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from their land. All right. They're bringing physical evidence from what they saw on account of all the things that they're going to say about the place. They're going to show videos that they took with their phones of the land. And they're going to show them how prosperous the place was. Here it says, this was their report to Moses. All right, so here they are. Just imagine this. They're sitting there, taking their turn. The whole congregation, two million people. That's the estimate that scholars give of the people that were out in the wilderness. And they sit there and they start going their report. They get their microphones and they start saying the things. It says here, we entered the land you sent us to explore. And it is indeed, listen to this. The 12 spies are all saying the same thing. It is indeed bountiful. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. Here's the evidence right in front of us. Come touch it. Come feel. Grab a, grab a piece of the fruit and eat it for yourself. But the people living there, oh boy, here we go. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. There's giants there. Yes, it's a beautiful land, but wait a minute. Hang on a second. It's, it, there's people there who are stronger than us. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites, li Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along the Jordan Valley. No, those people are way too strong for us. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the lands, he said. We can certainly conquer it. So these ten spies there are there to pop the balloon and say, no, we can't. We, we shouldn't even think about this. Let's pack our bags and head back to Egypt. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. We are, they, are, they are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. So imagine this. Everybody got on their cell phones and they started to text each other. Somebody posted it on Facebook. Somebody posted it on X. In fact, they even made a TikTok says, we cannot conquer the land. We're not going to take it. And man, it had thousands of likes, thousands and thousands of likes. And thousands of shares that the land was too powerful. In fact, look at this. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. We felt like grasshoppers. Friends. Is it possible that sometimes when we journey through life, we have the mentality of a grasshopper? That every single thing that comes into our possession, no, 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 this is too much. Listen, I'm going to tell you, I feel like that as a pastor sometimes. I feel like a grasshopper sometimes. So is it possible that sometimes that we, when we journey through life, we're seeing everything like grasshoppers, where everything seems like an insurmountable task. We can never do it. What is something that our congregation holds dear and wants with all their heart and all their might? Uh, and it's down the hill, by the way. 
In fact, it's down the hill and we actually own it already. We're not having to do a lot of red tape about the, the land itself. Yes, there's going to be red tape about how we built it and everything. But it seems like an impossible task for us, right? That we will never have a church. The city of Calgary puts too many regulations for us. We'll never do it. That's the mentality of a grasshopper, friends. We can never give into that mentality. Not the God we serve. Yes, there is red tape that we have to go through. Yes, we have to save money for it. But listen, friends. God has charted the course. Listen, listen, listen. God has already given us that land. It's ours. He's already given it to us. We cannot give into this grasshopper mentality. Here's uh, Sister White. Let me bring a little Sister White into this. In regards to this story, she, re she writes, From the same exalted source, the mighty general of the armies of heaven. Who is the mighty general of the armies of heaven? Michael, right? Says here, who's Michael? Jesus. Who's Jesus? The one who died on the cross for you and for me. Here is it says, Every true soldier of the cross of Christ must receive strength and courage to overcome obstacles that often seem insurmountable. The law of God is made void. You hear that? The law of God is made void. And those who would do their duty must be ever ready to speak the words that God gives them. And not the words of doubt, discouragement, and despair. Guess who calls me out when I start being negative in the house? My beautiful darling wife says, listen, stop it. You're speaking negativity into our children and you're speaking negativity into this home. Friends, when we speak doubt and discouragement, it, you know what? We sound like unbelievers. We sound like unbelievers when we do that. And here, nothing offends God than when we don't, when we put our head down and say that's impossible. But if we hold our head high and believe in the promises, here, here's, here's one I'm going to throw at you. We as Adventists preach the second coming of Christ. We constantly preach the second coming of Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe with all my heart that Christ is coming again. But here's the thing. I'm not sure if he's going to come in my lifetime. It doesn't, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Whether Jesus comes in my lifetime or not, I will continue to preach the second coming of Christ. Do you hear me? Because I know for a certain, in my grave, that he is coming again. It says, second, second takeaway, all right? God charts the course ahead of time. Here's it is. God delights and blesses a faith-based winning attitude. Faith-based winning attitude. Here's what it says. Then the whole community began weeping aloud. They cried all night. Wow. They cried all night? Everybody was crying? Because of the report of 10 individuals? It spread like wildfire. The negativity spread like wildfire. Friends, we spent the first part of the year talking about depression and the things that we say to ourselves. Right? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Is it possible that that even affects a whole community? Not just ourselves, but our families and our church family as well. If we keep a negative attitude, it will be contagious and affect everyone here. Let me give you the example. It says, the, then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in great protest against Moses and Aaron. If only... If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. If only, if only the house, the, the, the prices of house were not so high. If only I had had that job. If only I'd be back home. Do we ever get into this if only mode? If grasshopper mode? Huh? Friends, we have to be careful what we say. What we say with our words, when they come out, it becomes a reality. And these individuals decided to go back to the negative, negativity. If only we had died in Egypt. They had good food here. Why does God keep us out here in the wilderness? 
It says here, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Let's, let's vote. Let's call a business meeting, a church business meeting today, and we're going to vote uh, Moses and Aaron out, and we're going to put a new leader. That's exactly what they were doing, right? It says here, here's from the, this particular book, one of my teachers in school. It says here, the most important ingredient in church growth is to have a winning attitude based on faith and trust in God. Attitude involves the way you perceive things, your views, and how we interpret situations. Conflict, trouble, are opportunities. That's what they are. Yes, they may be painful at times, but they are opportunities. Here he continues and says, attitudes are contagious. Is yours, is yours worth catching? Is your attitude contagious? Huh? He goes on to say here, um, furthermore, attitudes are extremely powerful. Therefore, attitudes of defeat have a disastrous influence on others. It is unbelievable how just 10 ordinary people turn almost all of Israel against Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. 10 people determine the fate of Israel. It's unbelievable, right? And it goes on to sound familiar. One spoiled person in the congregation. Oof, oof, that's harsh, right? One spoiled person in the congregation motivates the entire church to have a defeated mentality. Friends, you know what? Let me tell you something. Sometimes I hear that we should be in a, in, in a church building. And I hear that. And I hear you guys. Nobody in this congregation will love to be in a church building more than myself. But you know what, friends? I understand that there are memories attached to this place. But we, our attitude, the perspective that we bring into this place is what changes us all for us. Yes, there have been some painful memories here in this building. But you know what? We're here for a few moments worshiping God, remembering all the good things he has done for us. These children of Israel, the ten, especially those ten spies, had been given miracle after miracle, and they failed to see them. Friends, I would like to say that God has performed mighty miracles in this congregation over the last 50 years. And, and you know, let me be objective here and say that, yes, there have been times where Mountain View has had painful moments in its past. But do we determine what we do based on those painful moments? Those are minor temporary bumps on the road. As we travel through life, sometimes we hit bump, you know, bumpy road. But it's only for a season. It's only we'll hit one bumpy road, but then that road clears up. That's what, that's what it is, friends. Let me continue here. Jesus, here's what the Bible says. Let, let's go outside of Numbers, the book of Numbers, and see. Here's the words of Jesus, speaking about the mustard seed, right? Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. What does it say? Everything is what? Everything is possible with God. Everything is possible with God. Here is... The Apostle Paul saying, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. This is the spirit that God has given us. Yes, they are going to be bumpy moments on the road. Yes, we're going to suffer losses. Yes, sometimes we won't be able, sometimes it will be so foggy that we won't be able to see where we're going. But here it is. God has not given us a spirit of fear, of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And uh, we go back to the narrative. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, or Nun, I don't know how to pronounce that properly, and Caleb, son of Je Jephunneh, tore their clothing 
in disgust of what was happening here. It says here, they said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. Calgary is a wonderful land. That property we own down there is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. Don't be afraid of all the red tape that you have to go through if you're wanting to build a church and grow your congregation. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is what they're saying. We've heard that many times in the Bible. And it says here, don't be afraid of where you're going to get the money. Keep doing your part diligently. Do your part. Let God worry about the rest. Don't be afraid. They are only helpless prey to us. Now they're reversing. First, the ten spies thought that they were like grasshoppers. But here, these two men are saying, they are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. They're there to remind the children of Israel of that. Here's what it says here. One of the commentaries that I was reading, I wanted to, I grabbed that and wanted to share it. It says that believers today need to stir up the same sentiments. If we think ourselves weak, we should know that God's power works best through unpretentious human weakness. Because our Lord Jesus has defeated all powers, we can be strong in his power, joining in his victorious rule. When Jesus took his last breath on the cross, he conquered death. And when he walked out of that tomb, all power was given to Jesus. Listen, friends, Satan is a defeated foe. He is. And all the obstacles that seem insurmountable, if we're diligent, if we're faithful, the Lord will help us overcome them. Here's my third takeaway. Third takeaway. First one is God charts the course ahead of time. God, the second one is God delights and blesses in a faith-based winning attitude. This isn't the prosperity gospel I'm preaching, guys. I'm not here to tell you that everything will be fine and dandy. Because it's not. We will face setbacks. We will face disappointments. There will be some bumps in the road. But we are to be faithful and true and continue the course. Which leads us to the third was God will rub his miracles in your face time and time again. Let me bring this into perspective. <clears throat> the children of Israel, when the ten spies have been sent out, that morning they woke up. They went outside and picked up manna and had food. In the middle of the desert, God provided food for the children of Israel. Not only that, for 40 years there was a shade in the sunlight, in, in a light that, that, that the glory of God shone on them in the evening for 40 years. Not one, not two, 40 years. They also remembered that God performed these mighty miracles as he took them out of Egypt. The plagues that happened. How the firstborn was destroyed of all the Egyptians. Um, how it rained uh, uh, hail. All the plagues that happened to the children of Israel are a testament of God's mighty uh, presence in, um, amongst their midst. The crossing of the Red Sea. How can you even forget one of the greatest miracles in the Bible where God opens the Red Sea. The Bible says that there was a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right. And the children of Israel walked right into the middle of that. God kept rubbing, rubbing miracles left and right. Now I'm going to bring it home here to you guys. How many times has God shown and performed miracles in your life and we still doubt his faithfulness to us? Hmm? Let me go back to this image here of our famous swimmer that I introduced at the beginning. So she was given a second chance. Miss Chadwick was given a second chance. 
So she got into the water again. It was two weeks later. It was still foggy. For some reason, it was foggy and the water was still cold. And the, guess what? The sharks were still present. And she got into the water and she started to swim. And uh, by the time she had finished, crossed the, other the, the, the first leg of, her, of, of the channel to the Cat Catalina, she had already beaten her previous record. And she swam back to the shore, uh, to the other side. And she finished it in record time, 13 hours. Whereas in 16 hours, she had asked to be pulled out. In, si in 13 hours, she finished and crossed the entire channel. Even though it was foggy, even though there were sharks, she crossed it. She was interviewed, and they asked her, what made the difference? You know what the difference was? Here's what she said. She said, I kept a mental image of the shore every single stroke as I crossed the channel. She had a vision and she had an image of where she needed to go. And she did it in record time the second time. That's what makes the difference. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Come up here, guys. Get in your positions, please, because we're almost finished here. I have three verses to finish. 1227, we're doing good in time. Three verses, just to remind us, taken from the Bible, to remind us of God's purpose in our life. Not just our life, but our, as a church family as well. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says here, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Right? I love that. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Whenever you feel weak and discouraged, that is when God is performing and working the hardest in your, in your heart. When you're feeling weak, when you want to give up, when all the chips are down, when you can't see the shore, when it's foggy, that's when God is the closest to you, friends. Here's another verse. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. If we feel that Satan has a hole on us, and that we can't shake it off. Here it is. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Friends, we serve a winning Savior. Yes, he did die on the cross, but he rose on the third day. That's the promise. And then my final verse here. And I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you, if you believe this verse, it says, those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. If you want to sit on the throne with Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my Father on his throne.
bow our heads for prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for, thank you, Lord, that we were able to wake up this morning and take a breath and have cognitive thoughts in our mind, Lord, and be able to do the many things that you give us the strength and the ability to do, Lord. Everything we do, everything we have, Lord, is because of you, and we owe it all to you, Lord. And so, Lord, as we move forward, Lord, and we take our next step, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you be our guide in everything that we do. And, uh, Lord, if we are harboring negative thoughts, if we are harboring uh, thoughts that will discourage not just us and our family and our church members, help us to expel them out, Lord, to get rid of them, Lord, and to put good thoughts, to put scriptural thoughts in our mind, Lord, of where you want us to go and where you want us to be, Lord. Be with your people here today, Lord. We pray for a blessing upon the food that we're about to eat, Lord, and the good time that we're going to spend charting a course for this church, Lord. Thank you to everyone that is here today, Lord. We commit ourselves to you in all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you, friends. I'm going to ask Sister Desi to come up for a second and give us final instructions as we prepare for our potluck. I'll, can we give her a microphone here so that she doesn't have to scream? <laughs> we don't have any like special, you know pretty much what it is. We just got some brooms that will help us clean up after. And that's pretty much, just don't forget maybe to check for your, uh, like what